Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Well, this is going to be tough, if I had to guess, anyway. It's Tuesday, and it's time for another one of our isms. And in response to a request from a listener, I thought I would devote today's program to the subject of Molinism. Molinism, M-O-L-I-N-I-S-M. And Molinism is a heavily philosophical uh theory about how to understand God's sovereignty and human freedom. Not long ago, my friend Dr. James White was engaged in a debate with William Lane Craig uh, on this subject, William Lane Craig being in favor of Molinism and Dr. White being opposed, and I am with Dr. White. In fact, if I disagree with Dr. White, I'd probably pretend I agreed because I'm so scared to have to debate him. But uh, William Lane Craig is no intellectual slouch. He's a smart fellow uh, and has a lot to offer that's very good uh, for the church. But Molinism, I believe, is not part of it. I believe it is a uh, deeply, deeply flawed attempt to uh, solve a, a genuine uh, difficulty and struggle. Let me see if I can explain what it is very, very quickly. Uh, Molinism takes the view that uh, God is, uh, God knows all things that are necessarily so. God knows what he intends to do. But in between these two, God knows everything that could possibly happen. This is called middle knowledge. Uh, it is the knowledge of all possible worlds. It sort of uh, resonates with the whole idea of the multiverse if you're a Spider-Man fan. Uh, but the idea that God knows if if this situation and this situation and this situation were in place, then I know this is what's going to happen. It, it's sort of also another way of putting it. It's a, a ooh, like a prevenient open theism, if I could say it that way. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, you don't worry about it. But here, here's the idea that God... Uh, looks at the free, uh, libertarianly free choices of what humans would do in a given circumstance. He looks at all given, all possible given circumstances, and he chooses uh, that option that fulfills his will. Uh, in essence, another way of putting it is it, it's a uh, providential foreknowledge view. Now, for the foreknowledge view with respect to salvation is probably the most widely held view uh, that deals with God's biblical language of predestination and election this way, that God predestines and elects those who he knew in advance would choose him. What this does, like a shell game, is it puts a responsibility uh, and the, the, the difference between eternity back in man's hands rather than God's hands. And uh, thus, at the end of the day, it's really just an Arminian perspective, which at the end of the day is just an open theist perspective. Uh, but what that uh, when i say a providential view what i mean is is that there's not just saying that about an individual salvation but about everything about whatsoever comes to pass that god uh has chosen that world that has everything fall into place the way that he wants to and by the way I, I don't have any quarrel with God knowing all possible worlds. I don't have any quarrel with God choosing uh, this world. However, here's where it gets really bad in my judgment. These possible worlds are only possible because God made them possible. That is, let me, let me put it this way. Any view that suggests that what comes to pass is something that God saw in advance and chose, 
uh, has going for it that it affirms that God uh, has sort of uh, his own divine imprimatur. It makes God the the uh, sort of uh, censor who says yes or no about whether or not this is going to happen. But it doesn't make God the writer of the story. It imagines a story, not just a story, an infinite number of stories that he didn't write. That's not who God is. God didn't do and doesn't do what he does by imagining what happens apart from him. In the same way, when we ask the question, taking it back to the view on salvation, when we ask the question, if okay, let's say God did choose on the basis of those whom he foreknew would choose him. Well, if he fore, if he knew in advance who would choose him, and we are what we are, who would choose him? Nobody. If God looked down the corridor of time at a bunch of totally depraved people who despise him, who are nothing but bad trees, who can bear nothing but bad fruit, how many of them on their own are going to come to saving faith? None of them. The same thing is true with respect to the whole of providence. That is, if God were to uh, sort of stop, be quiet and still and watch the future, what's he going to see? He's not going to see anything. It's a kind of ontological entropy. There's not going to be anything that he doesn't determine is going to be. Now, what the Molinus is trying to escape is the weight and the burden of, well, if God actually planned this, if God actually ordained this, if God actually chose this, then doesn't that make God guilty? Well, that question is asked in Romans 9. A question that doesn't get asked if the reality of the world is an open theist world, if the reality of the world is a Molinist world. It doesn't make sense to ask the question. It only makes sense to ask the question if God is sovereign over all things. And in fact, he is. So when you're dealing with a Molinist, I don't want you to think that you're dealing with, uh, one, a dumb person. This is a heavy thing. Two, I don't want you to think that you're dealing with someone who uh, hates God. But three, I want you to understand this is someone who is uncomfortable with the biblical truth that God ordains all things, that he brings all things to pass. In fact, it misses the obvious truth. That what is good news for one person is often bad news for another. Go look at Isaiah 45 and read God's ode to his own grace to Cyrus. And then remember that that ode includes the victories that God gave him over his enemies who were destroyed. Yeah, it's not a good thing. I'm not saying it's the worst thing, but it's not a good thing at all. So if you're tempted in that direction, I'd encourage you to give a listen to the debate between Dr. White and Dr. Uh, Craig. I hope that helps. The Great Commission calls us to disciple the nations which means it's pretty important to try to understand what a disciple is. Well, first, a disciple is not much more than a student. It's neither a magic nor an unusual word, but a simple one. We rightly distinguish between the twelve before the ascension of Christ and the twelve after referring to the former as disciples and the latter as apostles. While a disciple is a student, an apostle is a messenger, sent by and with the authority of the master. Which is one important reason we must never fall into the temptation of pitting Jesus' teaching against that of the apostles. Oh, Jesus never talked about that. Only Paul did is grievous error and a denial of the authority of Jesus. The disciple learns what the master says. The apostle proclaims it. 
Students have teachers, as do disciples. These teachers are among the gifts Christ gives to the church. See Galatians 4, 11 through 13. Disciples also, however, have curricula. Jesus calls us in the Great Commission not just to make disciples, but defines for us what our students are to be taught. Quote, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 20. A disciple in the context of the Great Commission is one who is being taught to observe all that Christ commanded. Who are these disciples? They're the nations. The Greek word translated nations in Matthew 28 is ethnos, from which we get our word ethnic. Some argue that Jesus is here commanding and affirming the Catholicity of the church. That is, the disciples are charged to disciple men all over the planet, from every tongue and tribe. Others would argue, however, that without excluding the call to disciple individuals from across the world, the text includes a call to disciple the, quote, nations. That is, we are to instruct and see to it that the institutions of the world, governments, cultures, educational institutions, that these all be taught to observe all that Christ commands. Either way, when we divide the Great Commission, when we push apart soul winning from discipleship, when we find the latter to be beside the point, a distraction, we are failing to be students of all that he commanded. Jesus is bringing all things under subjection, including every bit of ignorance and rebellion that still resides in me. Jesus is seeing to it that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. As his students, then, we should be learning his commands. As his students, we should be obeying his commands, including that command that we teach others to obey his commands. As his students, we should be learning to become teachers. As his students, we should be learning to speak his words, to become apostles, sent messengers from the one who is the word. As his students, we should eschew that lie from the serpent that doctrine divides, that a faith unsullied by study is more holy and pure than one marked by study. As his students, we need to learn that he has commanded us to not just be hearers of his word, but doers. As his students, we need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. As his students, we need to seek first his kingdom. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproulgr.com. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.